Buenos dias, everyone. My name is Patricia Reuter Lorenz. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan and a member of the Psychonomics Governing Board. It is my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Eleanor McGuire. Professor McGuire is a professor of cognitive neuroscience and a Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow at the Wellcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging, University College London. There, she heads the Memory and Space Research Laboratory. Professor McGuire received her bachelor's degree and her PhD from University College Dublin and a master's degree in experimental neuropsychology from the University of Wales in Swansea. Professor McGuire has received a number of awards for her outstanding contributions to science, including the Young Investigator Award from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society and the Rosalind Franklin Award from the Royal Society. She is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and this year she was elected to be a fellow of the Royal Society. Professor McGuire investigates how memories are formed and represented in the human brain. She approaches this problem using a variety of methods, including studies of neurological patients, functional and structural brain imaging, and clever behavioral assessments that link memory abilities with underlying neural substrates. She's focused specifically on the hippocampus, a structure that, as we all know, is widely recognized for its importance in memory. In addition to illuminating hippocampal contributions to spatial memory and navigation, Professor McGuire's research points to its pivotal role in the vivid mental construction of scenes, either from one's past or future imaginary scenes that have yet to be perceived. We're looking forward to hearing about Professor McGuire's research today in her talk entitled, what, where, when, why, and how of memory. Please join me in welcoming Professor McGuire. Well, thank you very much, Patty, and um, thank you also to Teresa and all of the organizers of the conference. It's been fantastic, and I'm so pleased to be here. So, let me get started. I'm going to focus on memory. Um, I gave Teresa this title about six or seven months ago, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. I can't quite remember what I was planning to say, but bear with me. So um, I'm going to focus on memory, and as we all know, um, memory is often regarded as being sort of separable from other aspects of cognition, so separable, for example, from perception or decision-making. And of course, we know that memory is not one thing. It um, has, uh, there are multiple types of memory, for example, short-term memory, but then memories can be longer term. And in particular, um, I'm interested in episodic memory or autobiographical memories. These are our memories for our personal past experiences. So when I talk about memory today, I'm really talking about episodic or autobiographical memories. So um, these sort of classical taxonomies of memory and this idea that memory may be separable from things like perception are still current in many textbooks today. Now a key reinforcer for this sort of view is evidence from neuropsychology. So in particular from patients who have profound memory problems in the form of dense amnesia. Um, and so these patients typically don't have deficits in all of these memory types. As we know, it's often just in some. And in particular, it seems to be in longer term memories and they often have very grave deficits in episodic or autobiographical memories. Um, and this sort of evidence has been very powerful in uh, illuminating how memory fractionates and what lines along which it fractionates. And these patients, uh, these neuropsychological amnesic patients, usually have uh, intact perception, they're able to make decisions, and so on. But there remains considerable discord in the field of memory because there is quite a bit of data that doesn't seem to be easily explained within these sorts of taxonomies. Um, and even some of the features of amnesic patients that we regard as sort of classic features are being uh, questioned. 
And so there has been some doubt cast on the way we conceptualize memory. So in this talk, what I'd like to do is to suggest that if we really want to um, understand memory, we may have to look at it in a slightly different way. So specifically, ooh, specifically, um, I think we need to sort of consider what it is we're trying to explain. So if we focus on episodic or autobiographical memory, I'm going to suggest that in fact it's not special or separable uh, from the rest of cognition. In fact, it's fundamentally embedded within cognition and that it relies on key processes that other functions also require. And it's these functions are these processes that we need to explain. They're the things that are special. And if we can unpick what they are, then we will naturally start learning more about memory. And so this goes beyond memory, because I think if we can understand what this core set of processes does, um, then this could offer a window into cognition more widely. Now, of course, autobiographical memory is not just one thing either. It has multiple components. But we know that amnesic patients retain their sense of self. Recent work has shown that they're actually able to do, engage in mental time traveling. They're even able to make associations uh, between new items um, in some circumstances. So, what I'm suggesting is that this isn't sufficient. These components are clearly not sufficient because their memories are severely impaired. So there must be something else, some other process or set of processes that is deficient in those patients that means that all bets are off in terms of their memory functioning normally. Now, why do we need memory is another key question. Memory is not just about uh, recording the past, because that actually would have very limited use. Memory, of course, is enabling us to plan and survive in the future. Um, and then I, I think it makes sense then to think, well, memory might share key processes with other aspects of cognition, for example, such as perception, because that would be a very efficient way uh, of running the system. Um, now this, of course, calls into question traditional dichotomies because it starts to blur the lines between modules of cognition such as memory and perception. I'm also going to argue that the key processes that uh, underpin memory are in fact online all the time. They don't just get engaged when we're trying to learn something or retrieve something. They're there all the time. And even when memories are very remote at the other extreme, um, these processes help us to vividly recall these memories in perpetuity. Now, how is this all achieved? What are these core processes that I'm talking about? What's the cognitive mechanism? Well, that's actually going to be the um, central theme for the rest of the talk. Where does this all occur? Well, it occurs in the brain, of course. Um, I'm not only interested in the cognitive aspects of memory, I'm very interested in understanding how they're realized at the level of the brain. Now, I'm not going to focus too much on this in the talk, um, but it will come, the brain will come into this in two ways. First of all, I'm going to draw very heavily on uh, new data uh, where we've been testing these very rare patients who have um, selective bilateral hippocampal damage. So you can see the hippocampus in healthy controls here, and you can see the sort of shriveled hippocampi of this amnesic patient. And these patients have been scanned at 3 tesla, at 7 tesla, and as far as we can tell, the damage seems to be very selectively restricted to the hippocampus. Um, now, the reason I want to focus on these patients is because they really allow me to um, speak directly to the sorts of 
um, patients who had such an impact on the development of this sort of classic memory taxonomy because the patients who um, informed this also had bilateral hippocampal damage. So we're talking about the same kinds of patients, but coming to very different conclusions about the nature of memory. Towards the end uh, of the talk, I'll also mention how we're trying to parse the processing that goes on within the hippocampus itself. Okay, so how um, have I come to my views on memory? Well, as we all know, um, these patients with hippocampal damage have got deficits in recalling their personal past events. But the cracks began to show really quite early on in um, understanding memory because we also know that these sorts of patients have deficits in certain aspects of spatial navigation. And this, of course, um, echoes work uh, from animals where we know that the hippocampus is also very central to navigation. So the question is, how is it doing memory and how is it doing navigation? Well, the sort of light bulb moment for us came when, with Demis Hassabis back in 2007, we took a set of patients with bilateral hippocampal damage and asked them to either imagine a future scene involving themselves or any kind of fictitious scene in their imagination. And you can see, of course, that they were very poor at this compared to control subjects. And in fact, the nature of their problem seemed to somehow revolve around the fact that the scenes were very fragmented, so spatially. So they did know what sort of objects um, to include in the scenes, but they couldn't put the scene together in a spatially coherent manner. Now, they could imagine single isolated objects, but not scenes. And just to show you what this looks like when they're trying to describe scenes, here is the cue, imagine you're lying on a white sandy beach in a beautiful tropical bay. Um, and you can see the control subject has a very nice description, a sort of scene that you or I could easily imagine ourselves and step into. And it's just not the same for the patient. The patient really struggled, clearly has some elements that you would definitely have in this scene, but really struggled, wasn't, really didn't have um, this scene in his mind's eye. Now the patients have insight into um, their difficulty. So if you ask them what's the problem, patients say something like this, there is no scene in front of me here, it's frustrating because I feel like there should be. I feel like I'm listening to the radio instead of watching it on the TV. I'm trying to imagine different things happening. There's no visual scene opening out in front of me. So here we have a set of patients who supposedly have a selective memory problem, and yet they also can't imagine even the most basic fictitious scene. So on that sort of basis, we wondered was in fact constructing scenes a key feature of what was underpinning their problem? And by a scene, I mean a spatially coherent representation of the world, small or large scale within which we could operate. And so we came up with this scene construction theory, which suggested that the hippocampus facilitates the construction of scenes into which details of an event might be bound, enabling them to either be re-experienced, so recalled, or pre-experienced, so imagined uh, in the future within a coherent spatial context. And so the idea is, is not so much that memory sort of sits as a module that may be separate from other aspects of cognition, but in fact it might be something a bit more like this. So we have uh, scenes as being a, a key set of under, constructing scenes, key set of um, underpinning processes that autobiographical memory and also, for example, spatial navigation might need to draw upon. So the idea is not that scenes are exactly equal to memories, but clearly episodic and autobiographical memories require other things like the sense of self and mental time travel and so on. But this vital ingredient um, 
is key to making memory work. Um, and if we think about it, whenever we recall the past or we're planning a route, scenes do feature quite prominently. And scenes are actually an incredibly efficient way of packaging information. Now, if we take this a step further, there are predictions that arise from this idea. And one of them is that tasks that require or could benefit from constructing an internal model of the world or a scenes, they'll be the ones that the amnesic patients will struggle with. But crucially, this won't be just in the context of memory tasks, but across all of cognition. So it could include perception, short-term memory, decision-making. So what I want to do uh, for the most of the talk now is look at how we've tried to test this kind of prediction in these sorts of patients and see how, where we went, end up at the end uh, in our view of memory. So if we start with visual perception. Around the same time that we were looking at scene construction ability in patients, amnesic patients, Kim Graham and Andy Lee, then in Cambridge, um, were testing similar kinds of patients, um, looking at their perceptual abilities. And they typically used things like oddity judgments. So for example, here's a set of four faces. Um, Three of the faces are actually of the same person, um, and one is the odd one out. Um, but the faces of the same person are shown from different angles, um, and the patients were actually very good at um, finding uh, the odd one out from among the faces. That wasn't the case when scenes were used as the stimuli. So three of these pictures show the same scene and one is a different scene, the odd one out. And the patients had a great deal of difficulty uh, trying to select the odd scene out. So from this, Kim Graham and colleagues um, suggested that actually the hippocampus is not only needed for memory, it's needed for perceiving scenes. Now, other groups subsequently um, disputed this, suggesting that in fact, the kind of memory abilities needed to hold information online about these, um, these scenes may exceed the capacity of short-term memory. And then you require long-term memory to do the task, which may explain why these amnesic patients uh, weren't so good at it. We would have a different interpretation. So there's a third interpretation, which is that in order to actually decide which scene is the odd scene out, you need to internally model the scene, and you need to be able to rotate them in your mind's eye to work out which is the right scene, or the wrong, the odd one out, in fact. So we would suggest that perhaps the patients were down because they couldn't construct the scene in their mind's eye. So we thought, well, can we push this a bit further, see if we can get some clarity on this issue? So what we did was um, use a paradigm or a phenomenon known as boundary extension. This was discovered by Helene Intrau back in the uh, late 80s. So typically in a boundary extension task, subjects look at a picture like this, very, very simple scene for, say, 15 seconds, and then they have to immediately draw it from memory. And this is usually what people draw. So if you can see, people have included a lot of extra scene than was present in the original. And this effect is known as boundary extension. Boundary extension is implicit. It is ubiquitous. We all do it. It's automatic. Um, it's scene specific. And crucially, it depends on scene construction. Because if you want to add in extra scene around uh, this um, stimulus, you need to be able to imagine what might be there. So for people who aren't familiar with boundary extension, just let me very quickly show you how it works. So you're given a study picture. We uh, typically automatically extend that picture when we're perceiving it. So we imagine not just the picture, we also include this extra um, part of the scene that we uh, imagine might be there. So this is what our internal representation ends up looking like. 
So that when I show you this test picture and ask you, is it the same uh, as the study picture or is it a bit closer or a bit further away, you naturally say it's closer because you're comparing it to this, which is what's in your head. But in fact, it's exactly the same as the study picture. And so the classic boundary extension error in this task is usually to say it's a closer up view. Now the gap between study and picture test can be... <laughs> Ooh, that woke you up. Gosh, I think we might have some emotional amnesia effect now. You're probably going to forget everything I said. That wasn't part of my talk. Okay, so I was, I was talking about boundary extension. And I was telling you that the, the gap between this and this need only be as short as 42 milliseconds for this effect to occur. So you can probably see where we went with this. With Sinead Mullally and with Helene Intraub, we wondered what would happen in patients with hippocampal damage because they're very bad at constructing scenes. So we gave them a classic task. You see a picture, very simple scene, it's masked, comes back on, and in fact, every time it came back on, it was exactly the same scene. So the correct answer was, it's the same uh, view. Um, but unsurprisingly, controls a lot of the time said, oh, it's a closer up view. Um, but patients with hippocampal damage more often got it correct. So they saw that it was the same view because they're very bad at scene construction, so they're not susceptible to the boundary extension error that we're all susceptible to. And so we have this paradoxical situation where these um, very profoundly amnesic patients were doing much better on a memory task than the control subjects. Um, and so in a way it allowed us to tease apart a little bit memory and scene construction. And it shows that perhaps the issue is really their scene construction. And we looked at boundary extension in a number of other ways. This is, again, the drawing task. You can see uh, people are given these and they have to draw them immediately from memory. Patients did very well. Controls, including lots of extra space. Um, and these are immediately drawn. But you can see we're, and you know, you guys, you would all do this um, if you were doing this task. So you don't, you needn't laugh at our control subjects. This is really you and it's different, and it's interestingly not just dependent on vision. So when we blindfolded everybody, um, and they stay blindfolded through the task, and you, you have people feel a scene, so it's a haptic task, and then you take the boundary away, and then you ask people still blindfolded to replace the boundaries with markers where they think it was. The patients are absolutely fantastic at this. They're spot on. And the controls are wildly putting the boundaries much further out um, of the scene. So it, it doesn't just depend on vision, um, the boundary extension effect. So here we have something that's implicit, um, something that can't be attributed to a memory problem because the patients are doing much better than the controls. Um, and it seemed to us to have something to do with the fact that these patients um, have grave difficulty imagining scenes or even extending a scene in their mind's eye. They literally can't imagine what's beyond what's in front of their eyes. So we wanted to try and take this a bit further. Um, to see if we could really nail what aspect of scene processing is involved. So, we showed people some scenes like this. Um, and can you spot anything odd in the scenes? Do you notice anything odd going on there? You can shout out if you think you do. I'll show you some more scenes. What about these ones? Anything you notice about them? Say again? No pillars. No pillars. You're, yes. There is something. Hmm? Rug. Yes, exactly. So, oh. So, what we have are basically impossible buildings. So, if you can see, if you follow the line of the 
columns, you'll see that there's no way this can be back here, and yet the column is further up here. And here, it's very clearly illustrated. You have these columns apparently at the front of the structure, but if you follow them down, they end up at the back of the structure. So these are impossible, spatially, constructively speaking, these are impossible to have in the real world. What about these, these scenes? Anything you notice there? No? So you can see that there's some sharks lurking in this ornamental pond. That doesn't usually happen, maybe in Granada, but it doesn't happen where we are. And you'll notice that this, this man here isn't casting a shadow. So you can see that this is another type of impossibility. Normally, this, if this man's casting a shadow, this guy would be casting a shadow. And so when we gave these tasks to people, so they just had to look at a scene and decide if it was possible or impossible, people had very different strategies. So um, for the sort of Escher-esque type uh, spatial constructive uh, scenes, they tended to model the scene in their heads. They built a model of the scene, worked out what it should look like, and then they were able to say, no, what I'm looking at is impossible. For the more semantic um, violations of scenes, uh, people tended not to have to model the scene, but they thought about the, what would be associated with a scene like that, and then they were able to solve the task that way. So, predictably, we then wondered, well, what would happen if um, we asked patients to do this task? So, patients and controls looked at semantic possible and impossible scenes, constructive possible and impossible scenes, just one at a time, and they just had to say whether they thought it was possible or impossible. And this is work with uh, Connie McCormick in the lab. And what we found was that for making the distinction between possible and impossible um, scenes of either semantic or constructive in nature, the controls were equally good uh, on both tasks. The patients were really good at spotting the semantic impossibilities, but they were impaired at detecting the constructive impossibilities. So there was a clear dissociation between their performance on the two uh, tasks. And this is in the context of reaction time and difficulty ratings not differing between the groups. So here we have one scene being looked at at a time. So the memory load is very low. Um, the task conditions are matched across both uh, semantic and constructive. Everything you need to solve the task is in front of your eyes, and yet the patients were not able uh, to effectively detect the construct spatial constructive errors in the scenes, but were fine for the semantic ones. And here's some... Um, when we asked them, how did you do the task? And for the semantic scenes, it's quite interesting. They immediately just knew the patients if it was right or wrong. They were very quick and they were very, very good at the task. The controls, who were equally good, but you'll notice they were trying to make the possible impos or the pos impossible possible. So they started to imagine how they could make some of them possible. I started to wonder what possible these days. I could build something like this. We find this very commonly with controls. So in a way, they're also modeling the scene even in this semantic condition, but definitely not the patients. And then the real difference here for the constructive scenes, the patients knew what to look out for, something to do with the angles and the intersections, um, tried to work it out, but they, it wasn't sufficient. They just, because they couldn't model the scene and the controls, you know, you need to look at the perspective. I put it all together as a whole scene in my mind. I'm constructing the structure in my mind. What would a real scene look like? So you can see a very stark difference in the strategies that the um, patients and the controls um, used. And this is formalized here, showing that even for the semantic, the patients had a very inflexible approach to it, but nevertheless effective, they did well. But this really let them down for the constructive, where the controls were taking a much more holistic view of modeling the scenes. 
So amnesic patients are selectively impaired at judging if the scenes were constructively possible or impossible. The controls seem to have this coherent, holistic, detailed internal model of both types of scenes that allow them to work with them flexibly. Patients were really stuck with what was in front of their eyes and they processed it in a fragmented fashion. They weren't able to um, show this mental flexibility to model the whole scene. And so we suggest perhaps that a primary function of the hippocampus um, in scene perception may be to construct uh, these representations of scenes and this might be vital for modeling the world online during perception and also during memory recall. Now, the tasks we've talked about so far are sort of exogenous. You know, there are pictures of scenes predominantly. But if this scene construction idea is to have any merit, it needs to extend more widely than that. So what we looked at to address this issue is two quite pervasive forms of thinking in these patients and controls to see what would happen. So the first of these is counterfactual thinking. This is work with Sinead Mullally. So as you probably all know, counterfactual thinking involves reflecting on what might have been. What if I had decided to go to lunch instead of listening to this talk, I would have had a better time? That sort of thing. Now if you think about counterfactual thinking, it sort of has quite... Um, a lot of similarities with memory, because you have to um, go back in time for a particular event. You need to identify the point that um, you would have changed, change it, and then model the events going forward so that you come out of the counterfactual thinking with a much better outcome. Um, and that does seem to have a lot of commonalities with memory. So the question is, what would hippocampal damage patients do uh, when you try to get them engaged in counterfactual thinking? So we did quite a number of tasks, some of them very involved, um, but basically all of the tasks showed a really similar thing. Um, and so I'm just going to present a very simple task. And this is um, a task from the literature, counterfactual inference test. And it's full of these little vignettes like this. So Janet is mugged, attacked by a mugger 10 feet from her house. Susan is attacked by a mugger a mile from her house. Who's more upset by the mugging? I won't ask you to show hands, but basically what we found was that the patients and the control subjects were really similar in how they performed on this and a whole range of other counterfactual thinking tasks, which is a bit of a surprise, actually, because we thought they might be um, somehow different. However, um, what we then did was we then got all of our tasks and got a group of independent healthy controls to consider each of them and rate the extent to which they felt they had to imagine the situation in order to um, use a certain counterfactual alternative. And when you then go back and divide the stimuli according to those that you need to model the alternative outcome and those where you didn't need to create a scene, you find that the patients systematically avoided those counterfactual alternatives that control subjects said really they needed to imagine the scenario in their head to play out the counterfactual alternative. So there's a sort of subtle avoidance of the need to construct scenes. So the patients are great at theory of mind, they're fantastic at very high level causal reasoning in other aspects of these tasks, but if a scene typically requires uh, control subjects to imagine um, the scenario, then the patients don't uh, volunteer those as counterfactual alternatives. Now, there's another form of thinking that's even more pervasive than counterfactual thinking. That is, of course, daydreaming. You might be doing it right now. This is work with Connie McCormick. So we wondered, do amnesic patients daydream? So when the patients come to see us, um, we, we spend three or four days with them on their visit to London. 
And at various times during the um, visit, Connie would just stop and say, what are you thinking about right now? And she did that for all the controls as well. And then we systematically tried to analyze um, the nature of their mind wandering or their daydreaming. And the first thing to note is that the controls, there's a lot of sceniness going on in the old daydreaming there. Lots and lots of scenes being created in their mind's eye. Patients, much less scenes involved in their daydreaming. Also, they're more likely to be thinking verbally, and these are not, not sort of thoughts that describe scenes. Um, and this is much less in the controls, where the, the thinking in scenes is much more predominant. So the representational nature of their um, sort of background thinking is not normal in the hippocampal damaged patients, the amnesic patients. And also it's interesting to look at the sort of temporal aspects. So again, the controls were often thinking about the past during their mind wandering, um, much less for the patients. Patients were much more in the present. So they were thinking, um, you know, they really weren't thinking in a sort of forwards or backwards direction. In fact, when we analyze the type of thoughts in the present, it's very clear that the patients are very impoverished thinking. Um, the controls, again, are often rich with scenes, even in their, um, if they're thinking in the present. Um, this just isn't the case with the patients who are very impoverished uh, thoughts, even, even in the present. So here we have two very pervasive forms of thinking, um, counterfactual thinking, daydreaming, and you know, the ripples have gone out much wider than memory. These patients with selective hippocampal damage do not have uh, normal counterfactual thinking. They don't have normal um, daydreaming. So the next question that we asked was, well, what about actually making decisions? making decisions and taking actions. Is there any knock-on effect there as well? So what we decided to look at, again, this is with Connie McCormick, is moral decision-making. So we, we were generally interested in the relationship between amnesia and decision-making. We chose moral decision-making because we're also very interested in contrasting the hippocampus with the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And patients with VMPFC damage um, don't have normal moral decision making, and I'll unpack that um, shortly. They also have recently been shown by Elisa Chiaramelli's group in Bologna that they also don't have totally normal scene construction. So here's a sort of hippocampal task, scene construction, that's not normal in VMPFC patients. So we wondered, well, what would moral decision making be like in hippocampal damaged patients? We know these two areas are heavily interconnected. They often co-activate in um, fMRI studies. So we decided we would see what would happen um, when we asked hippocampal damaged amnesic patients to make moral uh, decisions. And so we used the sort of classic moral dilemmas task. Um, for those of you who, who don't know uh, much about this, I'll just very quickly run through it. Basically, you're given a scenario each trial, and you read the scenario, and at the end, you're required to answer a question. And it's always the same form of question. Would you do X in order to achieve Y? Yes or no? That's the question. So the first type of scenario is this kind of baseline scenario. It's a non-moral scenario. And um, basically, here's an example, and you're, you're um, harvesting turnips, as, as we all do. And um, if you choose one path, you harvest more turnips than another path where you harvest less. Would you go right in order to, to um, harvest more turnips? So this is really just checking that people are doing the correct logical thing, they're able to process the task, and in our case, that the patients are able to keep um, the scenarios in mind. And then we have another type, which um, 
<clears throat> involves moral judgments, but they're not really life or death situations. So this is the sort of thing where you're walking along and you find this wallet and it's packed full of cash. You've, you've fallen on hard times. Um, would you um, keep the money you found in the wallet to have more money for yourself? So it's not life or death, but there's still a sort of slight moral angle to it. Then we have these low com personal low conflict scenarios. So this is where the conflict between your rationality and your emotion starts to crank up a little bit. Now, the ones here in this are usually actually rejected by all healthy controls and even most patients with ventromedial prefrontal cortex damage. And I hope if you read this, you can see why. So you're driving along and you see this man whose legs are covered with blood. This poor chap's had an accident. You've got to take him to hospital. You think, yes, I do. But you, if you give him a lift, he's going to bleed all over your lovely leather upholstery. So the question is, would you leave this man by the side of the road to preserve said leather upholstery? Um, the vast majority of people would say no to that. No, I, I would not leave him by the side of the road. And these now, the personal high conflict, are the really the interesting ones because these are life and death situations. And in these ones, um, it's kind of, you know, controls say yes, sometimes they say no. VMPFC damage patients usually say, yes, I would do that. They take a very utilitarian approach. So typically these scenarios involve killing one person to save um, more people. And they, usually the VMPFC patients say, yes, I would kill every time. And they have very low galvanics, they're not aroused, they don't show increased arousal during this. It becomes a very logical utilitarian judgment for those patients. So here's the type of thing. Here, you're on a submarine, some poor chap is injured, he's going to die anyway, um, you're running out of oxygen and all the rest of it, would you kill this person to save the rest of the crew? So these are the really interesting ones that show a difference in VMPFC versus controls. So what happens with the hippocampal patients? Well, here's what happens. For the control ones, it's similar to the control uh, subjects. Also for the impersonal ones, this is the wallet. This is the leather upholstery. You can see that everybody more or less says no to that one, which is good. But here's the personal high. And you can see that, in fact, the patients say yes significantly less often than the control subjects. So, and you can see this here, if we look at low conflict and high conflict scenarios, it's all similar for the patients and controls, but you can see for the high conflict, the patients are consistently less likely to say yes than the controls. If we directly compare hippocampal damage patients with VMPFC patients, you can see this big disparity. So we have the VMPFC patient saying, yes, I must kill one person to save 20 people. The hippocampal patients are saying, no, I, can't, I cannot kill a person. And so while the VMPFCs are utilitarian in their judgments, hippocampal patients are deontological, which means it is never right to even kill one person, and they will not countenance killing anyone. Um, skin responses, we see that the uh, patients show a similar pattern to controls, but are generally finding the task arousing across the board, and particularly so for the personal high conflict, the killing scenarios. And if we look at the debriefing, we can see, um, we said, how did, you, how did you make your decision? And you can see that the patients, I decided based on what's filled right, um, I couldn't make a decision about killing, uh, taking a life. One life is as precious as five. And then they can see with the controls, you know, I would sacrifice myself if I could, if that had been an option. This is such a difficult decision. You know, I guess it's okay to kill people that would die anyway. And, you know, in the debriefing, they were kind of agonizing their way through this. And the hippocampal patient said, no, no, it's never right to kill anyone. 
And you can see that sort of reflected formally here in the debriefing. Very emotional responses from the hippocampal patients, more rationality showing through from the controls. But here's the interesting thing. The patients were rarely able to visualize the scenarios. The control subjects were visualizing particularly the high conflict scenarios. So the patients weren't able to do that. And somehow that resulted in them going to the other extreme, saying, no, I can't, I can't countenance killing anyone. So amnesic patients' moral judgments were based on this emotional gut feeling when faced with dilemmas that involved harming other people. Whereas the control participants' um, decisions were based on integrating definitely this adverse emotional response, but they visualized the consequences of one's actions and that allowed them to rationally reevaluate the potential future benefits, for example, of saving uh, a number of lives. So this balance may be disturbed in patients with either hippocampal or VMPFC damage. So hippocampal lesions impair the ability to visualize a scenario and its future consequences. And this somehow seemed to render the adverse emotional response overwhelmingly dominant in the hippocampal damaged patients. In the VMPFC patients, visualization might also be impaired, as I've said, but they're also unable to detect the adverse emotional response. So they're taking a double hit, the poor VMPFC patients, and really then the only option open to them is a utilitarian option. It becomes just an exercise in numbers to them. So you can see that even at the level of making decisions and potentially taking actions, this inability to imagine scenes seems to be upsetting the balance of cognition. So, I mean, I've mostly been talking about patients with selective hippocampal damage. Um, we've also, in our group and others around the world, have also been utilizing these tasks in fMRI, and we find the hippocampus indeed engaged when constructing fictitious scenes, perceiving scenes in boundary extension, and imagining the future. So providing convergent evidence that the hippocampus seems to be um, engaged during these um, tasks. Now, um, some interesting evidence recently is we took our impossible scenes task um, and we asked healthy controls in the scanner to look at set of scenes and say whether they were possible or impossible. The vast majority were possible, um, only a few were impossible, but they were in the particular mindset of trying to find either semantic or constructive impossibilities. And when you look at what's activated for finding semantic impossibilities, you see lots of lateral temporal cortical areas, which is uh, very nice. But for constructive, you find the hippocampus is engaged. So when you're trying to find constructive impossibilities, even when there aren't any there, you're engaging your hippocampus. When you're trying to uh, find um, semantic impossibilities, it's all lateral, temporal, neocortical. We're also um, trying to go further within the hippocampus. Now, amnesic patients are an amazingly valuable way of investigating hippocampal function. But typically their damage is along the whole length of the hippocampus. So it doesn't really give you any insights into what particular subfields or subregions of the hippocampus might be doing. So with Pete Seidman, um, we've been trying to understand more about the very complex anatomy of the human hippocampus, particularly the anterior hippocampus, which we think is uh, very important for scene construction. Um, it's a highly complex area. We're only still trying to understand how the human um, anatomy works. 
But nevertheless, we've been um, able so far to start delineating specific subregions of the hippocampus that may be important for um, imagining scenes, for recalling a material from the past or recalling more recent material, and different subfields um, within the hippocampus seem to be engaged depending on the type of task that you're engaged in. I won't go into it here, um, you can read more about it here, but um, I think we're, we have further data that we're um, trying to parse even further the contributions of specific subfields and their connectivity, generally the information flow around the hippocampus. So I'll end uh, there with a, uh, what I would say is probably a, a slightly alternative taxonomy. Um, and so the idea is that there are all these cognitive functions and they all operate differently and they all have different add-ons, um, but they all draw on this need or the usefulness of being able to imagine spatially coherent scenes. Um, and that includes memory, I would say. So I've tried to argue that memory and maybe many other cognitive functions rely on this key component of scene construction. Um, that this is very starkly illustrated in amnesic patients whose deficits seem to go well beyond memory. And it's important to note that I don't think these deficits are caused by their memory problem because as we've seen, a lot of the memory requirements were controlled across conditions and in one case, the patients actually had better memory performance than the control participants. So I don't think that's an easy explanation for all of the, these data. And I think this illustrates the connected nature of cognition. It blurs the distinctions between perception and memory, maybe short-term and long-term memory. And I would suggest um, that in fact scenes may be the currency of cognition. They sort of oil the wheels. And when that ability is diminished, the effects can actually be surprisingly far-reaching and potentially devastating. Now, of course, I realize that this sort of idea generates um, a large number of questions. So for example, what happens with verbal memory? How do we explain the absolutely fully acknowledged that by everybody deficits that these amnesic patients have in, in, in verbal memory tasks? How do you explain that in terms of scenes? And indeed, a lot of the hippocampal-based theories have quite a visuospatial bias. So this is a big challenge. How does sleep and consolidation fit in? I would say that scene construction is uh, very important uh, and contributes to memory consolidation during sleep. I think it's probably at the basis of our dreams. Um, so how does that work? And how do important computations like pattern separation and pattern completion that we know the hippocampus engages in, how does that fit in? So we need to understand more about the precise mechanisms and computations involved in scene construction. Um, we need to know what exactly the hippocampus does and its particular subregions. Um, and how does this interface with the rest of the brain? That's another really important question. And we are working currently on all of these issues. So it just remains for me to uh, say special thank you to all of these people. And again, thank you to Teresa uh, for the opportunity to come and share this with you today. Thank you. That, that ends this session. Thank you.